All right, and we are live with another book discussion. So every Friday, I hold a book discussion on one of the uh, either one of the popular book leadership books that's out there or one of the classics. Today, I've got a classic. It is The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. And I do these every Friday. You will see the schedule for the next few that I have up on the, uh, the comments here on this particular video. But we will simply go through, I'll summarize kind of the big parts of the book, and then we go over some of the highlights that I have that kind of got me thinking about how frontline leaders and supervisors can implement some of these things and some of the important points that were covered in the book and that like I'd add, like to add a little bit more color to it. So with that being said, if you've read the book before, if you have any questions, any comments, drop down into the comment section. We can kind of keep this going. And uh, with that being said, I'll just kind of dive in and Right off the bat in the introduction, Patrick Lencioni hits on the promise of teamwork. We all know that teamwork is important. And one of those big things about team building is it's one of those classic things in leadership that gets, gets left by the wayside. It's kind of like delegation. We all know that that sort of thing is important. And because it's important, nobody bothers to, for some reason, tell us how to do it. And so team building is one of those big things where we all know it's important, your team knows it's important as well, but we don't necessarily know the steps that go into putting together good teams, forming good teams, and maintaining those good teams. And so Mr. Lencioni takes a crack at it with this particular book. It is a very complicated and very in-depth um, sort of topic to get into, and it varies from team to team. And so I think he does an excellent job. I will tell you up front, that the first time I read this book about 15 years ago, I did not like it at all. And part of it was just me being dogmatic. It is a 220 page book and the first 175 pages are a story. A story that is very interesting, very well done, but doesn't have a huge amount of takeaways. It kind of glosses over some of those, um, some of those big points that he's trying to make. So good to see everybody, Patty, Mara, Mahmood. So, um, I didn't particularly like it the first time I read it. I did read it maybe five or six years ago. I liked it more. And this time reading through it was actually my favorite session. And so I did take more away from the 175 pages of stories. And then I did appreciate some of the points that were made in the ending section. The last 40 pages is kind of the nuts and bolts. Here's how you do it um, with some good points that were made in there. So um that's uh, that's that's kind of my confession in regards to this book. Mozam, good to see you here. But uh, the promise of leadership is or of teamwork is covered right at the beginning, and it's basically covered in a quote that he uh, references from somebody else. And it is, if you could get all of the people in your organization rowing in the same direction, you could dominate any industry in any market against any competition at any time. And that's the pro the promise of great teamwork. It's why team building is is so important. We see great functional teams and we see what they're able to accomplish. Now, one of the big reasons, Gary, good to see you here. One of the big reasons that that, that happens within teams is you cut through all of the BS, for lack of a better term. You cut through all of the politics on things, all of the hidden agendas on things, and people are free to work at their best and they're free to bring out the best in other people. And so, Kind of summarizing it here, he has a, a, a cute kind of pyramid um, on here. It goes through the five main areas, the five dysfunctions of a team. And I'll go over them right off the bat, bat and then we'll kind of start diving through. The first and primary, and it is a pyramid, so it builds on itself. So the first dysfunction of a team is an absence of trust. They don't trust enough each other. And the way this comes up most, most uh, likely in, in most organizations is that they have a sense of invulnerability. You don't want to be wrong. You don't want to be embarrassed. You don't want to have a bad idea. You don't want to fail. And because of all of those things, you don't open up. You're not vulnerable. We talked about this with Radical Candor a few weeks ago in Kim Scott's book. Being able to open up, express opinions, allows a whole host of things, not just ideas and the free flow of ideas, but the ability to um, cover for strengths, cover for weaknesses, and the ability to buy in that comes up in, in a section here very soon. The second area, so first, absence of trust. That's the foundation of a dysfunctional team. If, dysfunctional te if, if a team doesn't trust one another, they cannot be a great team. 
All right, the second aspect of it is a fear of conflict. So you may trust one another. You may know that each other has the, their best interests at heart. You're all working towards the same goal. But if you're not comfortable having conflict, then you don't bring out those ideas. You have what he, he classifies as an artificial harmony. And so people don't speak up in meetings. You know, if, if your meetings are boring, then this is one of the things, and this is one of my big takeaways from this. Cindy, good to see you here. One of my big takeaways from the book was that if your meetings are boring, if your meetings don't have any conflict, then that is an indication of a dysfunctional team. You need to have that conflict because that is what brings in buy-in. That's what brings in other ideas. And that's what builds relationships. So much of this, Jai Paul, so good to see you here. Um, that's what builds so many relationships is the communication. So I'll talk about you know communication as a foundation of team building. And that's one of the big things because what comes out of that is an understanding of each other and that builds trust. And when you have that trust, it's easier to have that conflict and to bring out different ideas amongst the team members, all right? So continuing on here, first, absence of trust, the foundation of dysfunction. Second is a fear of conflict. The third is a lack of commitment. So now we're starting to get out of the emotional aspect of teams, all right, where, where people don't trust, you have the interpersonal problems and you start getting into the issues as far as an organizational level from a team is concerned. The lack of commitment, where is the, amb and, and this shows up in ambiguity. We need to get this taken care of, but there's no deadline or timeline associated with it. We need to get this done, but then it's not talked about for another month. Getting commitment from people, and this is, the, these, this is where the, this pyramid links up, where you have, if people trust each other, if they get that first foundational block, then it is easier for them to get into having conflict, constructive conflict, from that constructive conflict, everybody knows that their ideas have been expressed. Everybody knows where everybody else stands. And then from there, everybody can move forward and have a commitment. And that's where it gets clear as far as a commitment is concerned. And you don't have the ambiguity of working towards something, but never knowing how you're doing with it and never really talking about it. And that's a big problem that starts getting into the functional aspects of a dysfunctional team. The fourth area is an avoidance of accountability. When you have, we sh you see this with low standards, where people, when people don't step up to what's needed, it is easily forgiven. So it may be that you have a weekly meeting. And in that weekly meeting from last week, Cameron was assigned a particular task. Lo and behold, we come around to the next week and, you know, Cameron, do you have an update on this task? No, I really haven't gotten it started too much yet. Well, in many organizations, that's simply just excused. Okay, well, we need to get that rolling. And in a functional team, that's something that really isn't acceptable. Well, where was the breakdown? Where, you know, where, was there something I could have done? My team could have done, somebody else could have done. Was there a dependency that you were missing? What, what happened? You dive into those areas. And so you hold your team members accountable. It can be an uncomfortable conversation. It can be taking something away from them as far as a responsibility is concerned, but you have high levels of accountability amongst the leadership team and amongst your team as well. The team holds people accountable, not necessarily just the boss in this case. The fifth area of dysfunction, the top of it, is an inattention to results. So when push comes to shove, when you see bad teams, here's how it really comes up. And, and where it throws up is, is, is they say, yeah, bleh. Patrick Lencioni says, status and ego. So, hey, my team did what they were supposed to do. So who cares? And the uh, subtext is, who cares that the organization didn't meet its revenue goals or its profit goals? Who cares about that? My team did what we were supposed to do. That's the status. That's the ego talking. You need an attention to what are the overall results of the organization. And what happens is, is people are able to see how they tie into that particular aspect or help others elevate their game so that they can meet their expectations in regards to that overarching goal. A clear attention to results. This gets into that, Rocky, so good to see you. Um, this gets into one of those similar things of forgiving a mistake. Well, we did what we were supposed to do. I did what I was supposed to do. Well, who cares? You didn't get the results that you were looking for. And that's really what it comes down to. Great leadership. I hate to say it, 
it factors into results. Did you get the results? And great teamwork is what helps get those results as well. So five dysfunctions again, going through them. Absence of trust, that is the foundation. Second one is fear of conflict. Third, a lack of commitment. Fourth, an avoidance of accountability. And fifth, an, an inattention to results. Those are what build on one another. So I wanted to, again, it's a 175 page story, kind of a fable he goes through in regards to a new CEO that comes into a Silicon Valley company that has all kinds of money, a great board of directors, a great product, all the things should be going in its favor, but it's not getting results. And the reason is, is it doesn't have a good team. And the first couple of times that I read this book, I went through the story and it's a great story. It, it, it moves quick. You'll see lots of tie-ins to your experience as far as work was concerned, but I didn't get a ton out of it. And this time, what I would challenge you to do is if, you're, if you haven't read the book, if you're going to pick it up after this discussion, and I recommend you do it, there's, there's plenty of good stuff in it. Look at the, the new CEO that's brought in. Her name is Catherine. She's the one that kind of runs the show here throughout this book. Look at to her as a model for leadership. Look for little tidbits that you can get into how to lead better, how she handles certain situations. The first couple of times I read this book, I was just looking at the overall um, storyline, all the over all the different characters. This time I read it really focusing more on Catherine and how she was dealing with particular situations. And I found that very instructive. And so that was something that's helpful and that would be a recommendation as far as reading this book. Think about it that way. Think of Catherine as a model, as a mentor for you and look for how she handles situations that come up in the book because they are very common situations in organizations out there and that you can pick up some really good tidbits from that. So um, I see it just right here. And so I'm just gonna kind of pull through some of the main, some of the things that tie into those five dysfunctions that we talked about. So the first one that they really start tackling is that lack of trust. And one of the indicators that your organization may have an issue with a lack of trust is that you, I see a trust problem here in the lack of debate. When you don't have debate within your organization, Within, when team members aren't debating the best way of handling something, when team members aren't debating who should be assigned a particular project, and it isn't just about deflecting responsibility, if you don't have a lot of debate in your meetings within your team, then you likely have a situation where you have a lack of trust. And so that can be one of those big indicators for you that even though you think you have a trusting atmosphere, that you've got a bunch of people that have worked together for a lot of years, you may still not have trust in that respect. Um, one of the ways that she goes, Catherine goes through and gets, gets people to start building on trust, and one of my favorite team building exercises is to get people talking about themselves. Everybody likes to learn about and talk about themselves. So one of those team building activities that I've used with new teams that are formed is Two Truths and a Lie, where you list out three things about yourself, and two of them are true and one of them is a lie, and people have to guess what that third part is. People love talking about themselves and learning about you know, themselves and about other teams. That's a great one as far as starting to break that down and starting to get that communication talking. People need to communicate and understand more about one another. And that's one of those big things and why communication is a huge aspect of trust is it leads to more understanding and that becomes that foundational aspect. Um, Another question that she asked the team, and I just hit on a, a couple of these um, in, in the trust aspect of things and some recommendations. Rosa, good to see you here. Uh, one, another way is to ask the team what they feel their single biggest strength and weakness is in terms of their constant, uh, contribution to the organization's success or failure. What is your biggest strength that you bring to the table that helps the organization succeed? And what is your biggest weakness that you bring to the table that might, might um, impact the organization in a negative way? Have people talk about that in themselves. And so these are things that can be done relatively quickly in a meeting. And over, you know, we don't get into a lot of team building exercises in this book, but I do recommend going out and on a weekly basis even, maybe it's a bi-weekly basis, you do a team building activity. You can Google team building activities and find a ton that will match your organization that won't seem too silly or stupid, that take five or 10 minutes is all, 
and starts getting people talking about themselves, talking about each other, talking about their strengths and weaknesses, and it creates dialogue. And so this and the other this is was the other one is what is the biggest strength that you bring to the table and what is the biggest weakness that you bring to the table? Just talking about those sorts of things. Now you see where when Patrick Lencioni talks about an absence of trust and how that often shows up is invulnerability. So people want to be invulnerable. You have to be vulnerable. You have to actually try. It's a, it's a first step in trust to trust people with your biggest weakness. What is my biggest weakness that I bring to the organization? Not just what my biggest strength is. And so you can see by just talking about yourselves, an exercise like two truths and a lie. And then this next exercise about talking about what your biggest strength and your biggest weakness is that you bring to the organizational table. You see where that starts developing and people start learning about one another a little bit more, thinking about one another a little bit more, and that starts bringing the team together a little bit more. Um, now, when we start talking about um, one of the big things that affects teamwork and one of the big things that affects organizations as a whole, you see this in, if you have a highly political environment, you likely have a dysfunctional team. And I've never seen it laid out exactly the way that Patrick Lencioni does it here. And so I'm going to say it and I'm going to repeat it again because it's, it's absolute gold and it clarifies the issue that people have with politics and why it is such a negative Politics is when people choose their words and actions based on how they want others to react rather than based on what they really think. I'm going to say that again because it really clearly lays out the issue with politics and organizations today. Politics is when people choose their words and actions based on how they want others to react rather than based on what they really think. And so that gets into an absence of trust. When you're not telling people what you really think, but you're telling them what they want to hear. That gets into a fear of conflict, the second aspect of a dysfunctional team. When you don't want to argue with somebody, you want to concede to their point of view, shall we say. Um, so I just, I, that was a really good takeaway that I got from it. Now, that was, and I underlined a bunch of little takeaways as far as the story, but that was it. Like I say, 175 pages. This is why it frustrated me 15 years ago. And there was only a few of those main key takeaways um, that I took from it. The big thing in a lot of what I underlined on here was the difficulty with putting a team together. The difficulty of building teamwork in your organizations. Have no illusions. It is difficult to build a team. Now, Patrick Lancio put on here, that it is not necessarily complicated, and that's true. It isn't necessarily complicated, but it is difficult. It is going to take perseverance. You are likely going to have situations where it gets worse before it gets better. You have to be able to stay calm and manage your own emotions, not just the emotions of the team, and that's a whole other aspect of things. And so what you see through the main character in this book, Catherine, is her extraordinary patience and thoughtfulness. You see her get emotional, but check herself before she exposes that emotion and takes more of a takes a more thoughtful approach to things. If you want to build your team, it is going to take work. It is going to take a lot of work and you are likely going to stretch yourself. Regardless of how much experience you have in management and leadership, you are going to get stressed. You are going to get exasperated by certain individuals and you need to be ready for it ready to take the long road to see yourself through those, those down times and the thoughtful road to be able to manage your emotions a little bit better. And so that was one of the big takeaways that I took from this is the main character, Catherine, and how she negotiated all of those different issues um, that she might have as she was going through and leading and trying to put together a team. So um, on page 191, uh, he actually goes, Patrick Lencioni puts in a team assessment. And I, I kind of, I really like this concept. I've used it um, myself in the, in the Seven Deadly Sins of Leadership. Amano, so good to see you here. And it is just a very simple, if you've got the book, again, page one, it actually starts on 192. Very simple, label it one, two, three. Rarely, sometimes, usually. So I'll, I'll say a couple of them so you get an idea of it. Team members are passionate and unguarded in their discussions of issues. Would you rank that a one? Rarely, two, sometimes, three, usually. 
Team members are openly admit team members openly admit their weaknesses and mistakes. Does that rarely happen? Sometimes happen? Usually happen. And so what he recommends is there's there's 15 questions here. And what he recommends is you actually distribute this to the team. You you, you can self-assess yourself. You can actually distribute it to the team and get them a, give them a, a, a stake in it as well. I'm I'm semi guarded on it, so just just so you know where I stand on like self assessments is you usually end up skewing them in some way, shape, or form. So you need to be aware of where you might skew those particular results. But what you can do is you take the five different areas, and so each of those questions relates to one of the five dysfunctions. And the idea is is that you highlight your biggest area of concern, and then you can start tackling that, or you start looking at those base levels. If everything is equal then maybe it's the base levels that you need to tackle and that will filter up to the other levels. But I really like the self-assessment here to see where to focus on. It may be completely obvious to you uh, where, where the issues lie. And we'll get into some, some aspects where it might be, be uh, come, come, come to the forefront a little bit more for you um, as we go through this. Now, we'll get into the meat of it. So starting on page 195, he gets into just the, the straight meat of, of the argument. Here's the dysfunction. Here's where it comes in. Here's how to deal with it. And so this I really consider is the meat of the book. If you don't have time for the story and the story's good and it reads really fast, just so you know, I want to say I read very average, if not even just a little bit slow. And I want to say it took about four hours to get through this whole book. So it reads very fast. But um, so Absence of trust. So trust is the confidence among team members that peers' intentions are good. Teammates must get comfortable being vulnerable with one another. So that absence of trust shows up when people are not comfortable and aren't clear that everybody's intentions and everybody's goals are the same or are good. So when I talk about teamwork, I talk about communication first and foremost, and then I often talk about team goals and putting people on the focus of something higher than themselves, above where they're at. So not a selfish goal, but a team goal. And when everybody is focused on a team goal, then it becomes okay to be vulnerable. It becomes okay to not be as good as somebody else in another area, as opposed to trying to hide and trying to cover up that and wasting energy in those particular areas. Um, as a result, they focus their energy and attention completely on the job at hand rather than on being strategically disingenuous or political with one another. The issue with trust in particular with this is that try, in a distrustful environment, you're wasting energy, you're wasting time, you're wasting thinking in covering up for your own mistakes playing other people, trying to figure out other people's intentions. When all of that washes away, you have more energy to actually bring to your job. That's the real benefit of having that trusting environment. Leo Bob, it's good to see you here. Um, so if you want more trust, bring people together a little bit more, tie things to, to larger goals. Most successful people learn to be competitive with their peers. It is a challenge for them to turn those instincts off for the good of the team. And this is a great point. We see this in our educational system. In most organizations, everybody is fighting for the same promotion, the same position. So everybody is jockeying for position. And that's where those politics come in. You need to make sure that everybody knows it's okay not to be jockeying for position and to be contributing to the team. Maybe it is that the person that's the biggest contributor to the team is the one that is going to get that position. Everybody sees that. Everybody works towards those mutual goals. Now, Patrick Lencioni puts in some members, some highlights of when people might be exhibiting a lack of trust or when you have a trusting team. And so I'll just go through the ones that he has listed here to identify where you might have an absence of trust. So I want to highlight for you areas that might ring true to you that, okay, maybe I do have an absence of trust in my particular organization. So members of teams with an absence of trust conceal their weaknesses and mistakes from one another hesitate to ask for help or provide constructive feedback. They hesitate to offer help outside their own areas of responsibility. They jump to conclusions about the intentions and aptitudes of others without attempting to clarify them first. They fail to recognize and tap into one another's skills and experiences. They waste time and energy managing their behavior 
for effect. So managing their behavior for the effect it has on other people as opposed to the goals. They hold grudges and they dread meetings and find reasons to avoid spending time together. So those are the indicators of an absence of trust. And so suggestions as far as what Patrick has down for suggestions as far as overcoming this particular dysfunction, he's got some good ones here. And it's, it requires shared experiences over time. This takes time. There's no magic pill to get a trusting team environment. This is why it takes perseverance to build teams. It doesn't happen over a week, over a month, over three months. Hey, you might go on a great team building exercise next weekend and you'll come back to the office and for a week you'll feel good and everybody will be working better together, but slowly but surely it will regress. You need that constant reinforcement of that and that's what, where you get the benefits and the durable benefits over time. So it is, requires shared experiences over time, multiple instances of follow through and credibility and an in-depth understanding of the unique attributes of each team member. Again, lots of communication, lots of understanding of what people do. Now, the, some of the specifics that he gets into, so personal history exercises. So having people go over their personal history, you will find out a ton about particular individuals. This is where in the story, I, I draw the correlation to the two truths and a lie exercise, where people can find out about one another. But you can also go over more details. So what is your, you have people present their resume to the team. What, or where were they working before? What was their educational background? How many kids do they have? You would be shocked how many people have worked together for years and don't know how many kids the other person has or what the name of the children are or what their ages are or what their interests are. You'd be shocked. I've had it happen before where it's like, wait, you have three kids? I thought you had two. And these are people that work together for three and a half years. And so... You'd be surprised people get caught up in their work and they don't pay attention to those sorts of things. So personal history exercises, that's the foundation for you. The second aspect is team effectiveness exercises. What skills do they bring? Eva, good to see you here. What skills do people bring to the table? So not just about them. Now let's start getting practical with it as far as the team. What are your, what's your skill sets? What are you good at? What are you not good at? What do you need help with? What are you learning? That sort of thing. Um, personality and behavior preference profiles. So if you haven't taken a Myers-Briggs test or the DISC assessment is one that I like, it's very, very simple. That's, that's why I like it and it gets at most of the aspects of the Myers-Briggs. But you can get those, um, those pamphlets very easily online. They are easy to implement and you have a simple discussion with people. It takes an hour, two hours, but you would be surprised how much it brings to light as far as personality traits. So I know that you are somebody who is more dominant or you are somebody who is more analytical with things. And now I know why we have disagreements when I bring a report to you or something along those lines, or I try to talk to you about the party that we want to play in. And all you're thinking about is the analytical numbers. So personality tests are a way to do that. So first talk personal as far as what, uh, uh, what people, what their background is, who they are, and what they bring to the table. Then second, hit more on, on their specific skill sets for the job. Then get into personality traits. If you want to keep going with this from a trusting standpoint, do 360 degree feedback assessments. And then experiential team exercises. So after you do 360, then you start talking about doing ropes courses or you know all taking a seminar together or that sort of thing where you're experiencing more things together. Uh, so that's that, those are the five things. Solid things as far as trust are concerned. The first couple of those don't cost you a thing. Easy to implement from a timing perspective. And then it starts getting a little bit more. But tackle those first couple as far as people's backgrounds are concerned. And then as far as what their skill sets are. And publicize those to the team. Mary, great to see you here. Now, the most important action that a leader must take to encourage the building of trust on a team is to demonstrate vulnerability first. This was definitely one of the highlights of radical candor from Kim Scott, a book we, we did, um, reviewed a few weeks ago. And that is, if you want people to be more vulnerable, if you want people to be more candid with you, if you want people to give more feedback to you, then you have to demonstrate that you want it first as a leader. So ask, where am I falling short as a leader? 
What is it that you wish I would do more of? What is it that you wish I would do less of? Um, so you ask that, you solicit that, and then when you get it, you thank them and tell them you're gonna start working on it. Um, is this video available on MP4 or available through, I believe it to be, oh, thanks Brian, I appreciate the compliment there. Yes, it'll be up on my Facebook page and I'll actually put it up on YouTube as well um, shortly after it this afternoon. So, But this live feed will actually stay on as a video recording. So anybody who's come to this a little bit late, you can actually start right at the beginning. And then when we end here, I'm gonna guess in another 10 or 15 minutes, you can watch the video replay. Brian, thanks, I'm glad you're interested in it. I'm glad you're finding it good so far. Um, now, we move from the first and the fundamental aspect of dysfunctional teams is the absence of trust. So once you've worked through that, then you work up to the next level. And the second dysfunction is a lack of conflict. Conflict is a really good thing. Some of the best discussions I've ever had has been me and my boss almost yelling at each other in a meeting and there was a new supervisor there. And we walk out of the meeting and we're trying to figure out where we're going for lunch. And I mean, we, we had, the voices were raised in there. We were passionate about the issue that we were talking about. And the supervisor goes, are you guys okay? Like, is this what always happens? Eh, no, not usually like that, but sometimes it can get heated. And so it was just interesting to see their reaction to it. But all great relationship, Patrick Lencioni's words here, all great relationships, the ones that last over time, require, require productive conflict in order to grow. Ideological conflict is limited to concepts and ideas and avoids personality-focused, mean-spirited attacks. The only purpose is to produce the best possible solution in the shortest period of time. Diving into that passion, having a debate about a particular course of action and issue. Again, you'll notice these are ideological. They are about ideas and they are not about personality and mean-spirited attacks. Be passionate. If you're not having meetings where there is vigorous debate in regards to issues, then you don't have a team that trusts each other and or perhaps you have a team that trusts each other, but they're just not looking interested in conflict. When team members do not openly debate and disagree about important ideas, they often turn to back channel personality attacks. I love this aspect of it. So when people aren't free to have conflict in meetings, to have disagreements, to have debates, what happens is, is they, they take that and they go to the gossip pool. If you have an environment that is gossip ridden, then you have a lack of communication in some way, shape or form, and you likely have an issue with communication and conflict. If you can tackle those things, then your gossip pool will diminish because everything is already out in the open. I already know that I have, everybody already knows that I have an issue with Cameron's, the way that Cameron does this particular thing because I've brought it up and him and I have tried to work through it and we haven't figured it out yet, but we will. And so when you bring those things out into the open, there's nothing for the gossip or rumor mill to talk about. I just love that particular aspect of it. But conflict is the crucible where good ideas come to the forefront. All right, um, that, that's such a key point. If you aren't having that conflict, if you aren't having those debates, that dialogue back and forth, where you're really trying to ferret out the idea, then you're not getting the best idea, or you're not getting the best version of a particular idea unless you bring that in. All right. So teams that fear some of the some of the highlights. So if any of these ring true, then you know that your team might have a fear of conflict. Teams that fear conflict have boring meetings. I love that. I love that. It's such a great indicator of it. They create teams that fear conflict create environments where back channel politics and personal attacks thrive. I'm looking at you out there. Um, ignore controversial topics that are critical to team success. Fail to tap into all the opinions and perspectives of team members. Waste time and energy with posturing and interpersonal risk management. All right, those are some of the indicators. And, and, and Patrick Lencioni in the book goes into some, you know, flips those things so you can see where teams that exercise great conflict have in, but I just won't go into all of those because I think it's easier for us to see some of these uh, aspects in our own teams. So if you want to get better at conflict, let's say you've, you've started tackling um, an absence of trust or an absence of trust wasn't nearly as big of an issue as conflict was when you took the self-assessment at the end of this book. The couple of things that he mentions in regards to conflict are mining. I, I love this, this concept, mining for conflict. And he recommends even having somebody that is tasked 
with mining conflict. What you want to do is you want to, as a leader, and it's easiest as a leader, is to bring out the conflict. Now, Cameron, I know that you're going to have an issue with this, so tell us your side of it. So you almost have a mediator that's bringing the conflict up and talking things through and encouraging people to talk it through. And that's the other thing. So real-time permission. So you have, you're mining the conflict. You're bringing it out. You're actively looking for it because remember, conflict is what's going to lead to a better idea and better results for you and your team. So once you've looked for it, you also give real-time permission. A lot of times, people will look to have a sidebar conversation. You know what? Let's just talk about this later. Or they'll, somebody will just give up. You know what? Fine. We'll just do it your way. So he talks about real-time permission here. And that's where somebody says, no, no, this is good. This is why we're here. Let's keep talking it through. Who else would like to help Cameron with this particular point? Or who else would like to help the other side with this particular point? So you're giving real-time permission to have these discussions. Now, this doesn't mean, and this isn't actually addressed in here, but uh, I know it happens in the story at some point. This doesn't mean that these, these debates go on forever. At a certain point, once the, all the ideas have been brought out, then it's time for a decision. And that decision can be made by the leader. Yeah, oftentimes that's the case. It can be made by a vote if you want to take a vote on things, in which case if there's a tie, then the leader gets to decide the tie. But once all the opinions and all the details surrounding those opinions have been expressed, then you can go ahead and make a decision. And that, uh, that leads into the other good things here that I'm going to get into before I finish up here at conflict. Behavioral performance tools that allow team members to better understand one another. This is where you get into when you had that absence of trust. And we talked about personality tools like the Myers-Briggs or the DISC assessment. When you have those personality tools in place, people can see where some of that conflict naturally arises. And it doesn't become that Cameron is an obstinate jerk. No, it's that Cameron is an SI as far as the DISC assessment is concerned. And so he's way more concerned about the personal matters and the people aspect of things as opposed to the analytical stuff that I care about. And that's where our disagreement ends up coming up. Not necessarily because Cameron is obstinate or I'm obstinate. It's because of our personalities. And so it, it moves the discussion kind of a level higher, shall we say. And that's one of those benefits of having those particular assessment tools. Um, so one of the things is your role as a leader in this is to mine for that conflict, to bring it out. You'll notice that those first two things, the, the two things that are mentioned on there, giving people permission. Yes, this is why we're here is to talk things through is the comment that's made in here is this is not unlike parents who overprotect their children from quarrels or altercations. And what he's talking about is when we try to diffuse conflict. Let's hey, let's all simmer down now. You know what? Let's let's take this this outside. Whatever you try to simmer it down. It's not that you want it boiling out of control as far as the conflict is concerned. You want good, steady conflict. But too often we avoid conflict wherever possible. A good leader seeks out the right kind of conflict, um, and it also leaves them hungry for resolution that never occurs. I see this a lot in having interpersonal conflicts and mediating interpersonal conflicts where you bring in two employees who have problems with one another. And what happens is you allow them to air their grievances. You mediate the discussion, but you tie it back to overarching goals and you bring understanding to each of them as far as where the other person might have been coming from. What happens is that brings resolution to an issue. I've had people who were enemies for months, if not years, come together and be decent friends in the workplace after you have one of these meeting discussions because it actually resolves so many of the issues. They're able to see some things. And so conflict resolves certain things and allows people to move on as opposed to holding on to that stuff. And that, that holding on is what weighs them down and helps so many, or hurts so many teams from progressing further along with their goals. By engaging in productive conflict and tapping into team members' perspectives and opinions, a team can confidently commit and buy into a decision. And that leads directly into the third dysfunction of a team, which is a lack of commitment. A lack of commitment comes directly from that absence of trust and that lack of conflict. When you don't have those things in place, it's easy to not buy in. 
it's, it's easy to be more ambiguous as far as what you're going to deliver and uh, a lack of commitment. In the context of a team, commitment is a function of two things. So two things, if you need more commitment from your team, and I'm talking you know, about your teams, it, good teams, bad teams, whatever, if you want more commitment, you're looking for clarity, a clear understanding of what the issue is, what the project is, what the, what the goals are, clarity, and buy-in. All right, the two greatest causes of a lack of commitment are the desire for consensus and the need for certainty. I'm going to say that again. The two greatest causes of a lack of commitment are the desire for consensus and the need for certainty. Great teams ensure that everyone's ideas are genuinely considered. You want to consider everybody's ideas. You want to get their feedback. One of the biggest, biggest issues in every survey of employees, one of the biggest dissatisfiers is management doesn't listen to me. You want to listen to each and every person's opinion in regards to something. You never know who, who has the great and the next great idea, but you don't necessarily need to go along with it. And people understand that. People just want to be heard. They realize that, you know what, they've heard five different opinions. They know somebody isn't going to get their way in it, but they want to be clearly heard. They want to know that you're giving it careful thought. You're not just doing it for an exercise. The second thing is certainty. A decision is better than no decision. Most teams, military teams, etc., also realize that it is better to make a decision boldly and be wrong and then change directions with equal boldness than it is to waffle. So dysfunctional teams that try to hedge their bets and delay important decisions until they have enough data. So we've seen this before. Well, let's do a little bit more planning. Well, let's get another report. Let's look at another week's worth of data before we make a decision on this. Too many times that's just delay tactics. If you're looking for all of the information to make an absolutely perfect certain decision, you are going to be waiting forever. Most of the time that's the case. So you have to use the information that you have, match those against the goals of your organization, and make a decision on the best way to go there. And then if you find that that's not the best way, then you pivot and make another decision. You can see this, um, you see this play out, there was an old study done, um, an exercise many of you may have seen before, it's the marshmallows and spaghetti. So you take uncooked spaghetti, you take a handful of marshmallows, some scotch tape, and the, you have 15 minutes, 20 minutes in teams of five to build the biggest tower. So the highest tower, the highest tower wins. And so they got people, they got a bunch of MBA students together. They did worse, the worst of everybody. They had a bunch of medical students get together. They had a bunch of lawyers get together. All right, again, not so great. CEOs, they, when they did this test with CEOs, they did pretty decent, all right? But the number one team, the team that consistently built the highest tower out of marshmallows and spaghetti was the team of kindergartners. Kindergartners consistently beat out MBA students, medical students, law students, and CEOs in building a bigger tower. The reason was they had high degrees of trust and they iterated. That was the big key to it. They just went and tried. They were grabbing you know, marshmallows and, and materials from people's hands. They tried a bunch of different things. What happened in too many cases is people were planning. And so what happened is they planned, they spent 10 or 15 minutes planning, and then they had five minutes, they put it together and realized that it didn't work. And so they weren't learning anything from their failures. And so the ability to make a clear decision, to commit to something, have the overarching goal in mind, but commit to a way to get there and then pivot and move as you, as you go is something that's extraordinarily important for high functioning teams. All right. Um, a team getting into, again, his, his highlights on what is indicative of a team that has a failure to commit versus a team that does have a, a, a team that does commit, creates ambiguity among the team about direction and priorities. Watches windows of opportunity close due to excessive analysis and unnecessary delay. Breeds lack of confidence and a fear of failure. Resi revisits discussions and decisions again and again and again. We've all been in those meetings before. And encourages second guessing among team members. So instead of encouraging decisions amongst team members, you encourage second guessing among team members. No wonder you have a failure to commit. Um, the way to... to 
drive commitment into your organization. If you have a fear of commitment, the way to drive it, first one is cascading messaging. So whatever it is that you are committing to, whatever it is that you decided, spend just a couple of minutes at the end of the meeting coming up with some talking points summarizing the course of action. So what you do in this case is you take that course of action and broadcast it to everybody. So it might be that you're with a bunch of department heads. Well, you come up with what are the talking points and everybody brings those talking points back to their team. It's a form of peer pressure. The other thing, deadlines. That's the second aspect. If you want more commitment from people, give clear deadlines. That is the failure of so many projects and so many initiatives is that there were never deadlines given. So it's easy to just keep stretching it out. Contingency and worst case scenario analysis. This was one of the biggest takeaways that I took from my career. I would go forward with, a, I don't know, probably a dozen different new system implementations over the course of my career. But it was easy to go forward with those if I knew what the backup scenario was if I had to pull the plug on it. So let's say the system isn't working at all. Okay, what does it take to go back to the way it was before? What does it take to do it manually? What does it take to do it on paper? Do I need to print something out beforehand? When I was clear what the contingency was for the worst case scenario, it allowed me to boldly go forward. So a little bit of time talking about the worst case scenario and contingency planning can give people the freedom to move forward because they know that the world isn't going to collapse if this does, doesn't go the way that you want it to. Um, the last point that's made on here in regards to getting commitment is low risk exposure therapy, which was a really fancy way of Patrick Lencioni saying, try small commitments first and then move into larger commitments. So. With almost anything that you want to get better at, I recommend, and this goes directly with this, start small. What is the smallest thing you can work on getting a commitment from your team at? What's the smallest thing? What's the smallest next step that you need to take in a project? That's what gets the momentum going. That's what builds that muscle mind memory of commitment in this particular case. It's what also builds up use cases that you can use to defend that point of view down the road or defend that particular method of doing things down the road. Well, remember when we did this and this? Well, yeah, those were small things. Yeah, they were small things, but it's the same principle that we're putting into place with this larger thing. So you're building up that experience. So starting small is almost never a bad idea unless you need to start making some bold, uh, big moves in the organization. The leader must be comfortable with the prospect of making a decision that ultimately turns out to be wrong. That's the role of a leader as far as driving more commitment. You need to be comfortable making a decision that might be wrong. And confessing mistakes is a great way of modeling that for everybody. Hey, we're going to go forward with this. And in my experience, I've made mistakes with this before, with this before. When you can call out your mistakes, then people are gonna be more free to make mistakes themselves. The fourth, fourth dysfunction is avoidance of accountability. Team members begin to resent one another for not living up to the expectations and for allowing the standards of the group to erode. We've had, most of you have had this before where you've been on a team project or you've been in an organization and everybody in the last, last week's meeting had all of these takeaways that they needed to do. You went and you did all of your takeaways and then you get back together a week later, go through and all of a sudden you find out you're the only one that did anything in regards to this in the last week. And so what does that do? That erodes your trust. That erodes your willingness to do this again in the future. Sometimes a little peer pressure isn't a bad thing. So he dives right into the, oh, well, you know what? Let me go um, through some of the things that indicate um, a lack of accountability within teams. So a team that avoids accountability creates resentment among team members who have different standards of performance, encourages mediocrity, misses deadlines and key deliverables, places an undue burden on the team leader as the sole source of discipline. What you want is you don't want as the leader to be the person holding your employees accountable. That's a different topic. You want the team working together and the team to hold each other accountable. It's about peer pressure, quite frankly. You don't want to be the only person amongst your team that didn't deliver. And it's not you that's asking somebody why they didn't deliver, what could they have done differently? It is the team members. And so as a leader, and this is the great takeaway from Catherine, who's, who's the leader in the story for those that are tuning in a little bit later here. 
she is very good at saying, you know what, it remaining quiet and letting somebody else chime in. Or asking, hey, can somebody else chime in here and, and ask what happened? And so she's encouraging the team to do this, not to rely on her constantly to do it. The way you tackle it, so some of the key, key things that, that Patrick Lencioni puts in here as far as addressing uh, this aspect of team building of lack of accountability is publication of goals and standards. Love this. I love putting up on a board, here's what our goal is. Our goal is to reach 15% profit margins. Our goal is to reach this level of revenue. Our goal is to reach this level of invoices processed, orders shipped, this level of abandonment as far as calls answered. This is our goal and then you track that publicly. That's a great way of holding everybody accountable to preferably the one team goal. I've used it before where it's three team goals. Usually you have um, two that kind of counterweight each other. So oftentimes you can get lots of revenue. I'll use that example. You can, you can get lots of revenue, but you're buying that revenue with a profit margin that decreases. So it's great. We hit our revenue goal, but our profit plummeted because we bought that revenue basically by having a cheaper product than we wanted. So you have those balancing ones as well in there, but publish those. Simple and regular progress reviews. So one, great you have it up there publicly. Great everybody knows what the goals are. How often are you meeting and talking through your progress in regards to those goals? Where are we at? What can we do? What is everybody doing? What's your action item? What's your action item? What are you working on in regards to this? And you talk it through. That's one of the big aspects of this as far as team building is concerned is it isn't just the individual. It is everybody else that's going on. There's an example, and I may, I may come up on it here, um, but it was an absolutely fantastic example. And that is, imagine if you are in a basketball game and instead of the coach calling everybody into the huddle and talking through what each of the team members needs to do, okay, you, you're the center, I need you to box out better, the point guard, I need you to be more aggressive in driving to the hoop, I need you to do this. Instead of having that team huddle, imagine if the team just took each person back individually and said, this is what I need you to do. Then sent them on their way, brought them in, this is what I need you to do. That's not a team. That's a bunch of individuals at this point, and they're not going to work as well together. One of the hugest takeaways from this and some of the discussions here is that it needs to be a team environment where they are talking, where they are holding each other accountable, where they are bringing up ideas on how to make things better with each other without the leader being present. In fact, and, and too many leaders are holding on to that. And what you're doing is you're limiting your team's ability to work together and reach the best solution. Step back away from it and let them manage themselves while you watch and you direct and you mediate the discussions um, as they go along. The third thing is team rewards. So it is an individual achievement. It is team achievement. Worked for a Fortune 500 company here in Las Vegas and they have I don't know, eight, eight, nine different resorts here on the Strip. The property presidents were incentivized based on individual property performance. So when I was a part of a corporate entity, they didn't want to work with me because they didn't care that the overall organization was going to make more money, save money, increase revenue with this initiative. It was the impact that it might have on their entity. They were incentivized not for organizational performance, but for their department performance in this particular example. Make sure that you're rewarding people for team goals, not for individual goals, all right? The last thing, uh, last dysfunction on here is an inattention to results. So it's great that you have all of these things. You've got trust. You've got the right kind of conflict. Um, people are being held accountable, and I'm missing one here. Um, and people are committing to, to what they need to do. None of that matters if you're not getting the results. The results is what you're after. So what happens when you're not getting the sort of results? Well, I'll show you some indicators that Patrick Lencioni lists out here. A team that is not focused on results, stagnates and fails to grow, rarely defeats competitors, loses achievement-oriented employees, encourages team members to focus on their own careers and individual goals, and is easily distracted. So 
you want, it's similar to the last one. His recommendations are similar to the last one in that it's public declaration of what the results are that you're looking for and results-based rewards. You want to avoid situations where people are just happy to be a part of the team. It's one of the, you see this, I want to say, almost in the NFL, where, okay, I've been drafted. Now I've made it. And no, you haven't. Now you've reached the next stage of area where you need to work even harder. Um, you might see that, it, you know, hey, I'm at Google. That's good enough for me. I don't need to achieve anymore. I've been employed at Google or Facebook or whatever company is your dream company to work for. Or it refers to the very familiar tendency of people to focus on enhancing their own positions or career prospects at the expense of their team. And that's individual status. And I think this is one of the biggest ones that everybody sees out there where somebody is hoarding resources for their own personal performance and it is hurting everybody else. It, they, they aren't helping the team get their results. They're making sure that they hit their numbers and who cares if nobody else hits their numbers. That's not the sort of environment that you're looking for. So look for those particular aspects. Teamwork ultimately, and he's just kind of summarizing it here, Teamwork ultimately comes down to practicing a small set of principles over a long period of time. And I'm going to hit that one more time. It is difficult. It takes perseverance. But it is not complicated if you can see your way through it. Put in the effort. Manage your emotions and the emotions of your team. You can get through it. By acknowledging the imperfections of their humanity, members of functional teams overcome the natural tendencies, and these are all human nature things, that make trust, conflict, commitment, accountability, and focus on results so elusive. All right. Last comment here is, is a note about um, Catherine, um, who is the main character in this story. And that is, Catherine understood that a strong team spends considerable time together and that by doing so, they actually save time by eliminating confusion and minimizing redundant efforts and communication. All of those team building exercises, all of those shared experiences that you and your team have together have an impact. I'm going to say, you know, I can't highlight this enough. When you cut through those things, you actually save time. You don't, you communicate better. There's not miscommunication. There's not confusion. And there's not redundant efforts and other wasted time because people understand one another easier. They trust one another easier. And that's the big benefit. And that's why spending a simple amount of time a week, five, 10 minutes even, is just gold. It's almost a no brainer as far as building up these relationships because you'll get that time back down the road. So the five dysfunctions of a team, worth the read. If you're in a pinch, you can skip the first 175 pages. That's the story. It is a really good story. You'll like it um, quite a bit. And there, But then the meat um, is, is there at the end. But there's some really good things. And as he mentions right off the bat, team building is one of those things that unlocks extraordinary results if you can get it. So spending a little time working on your team building skills as a leader is something that's going to pay off for you down the road. So tune in next week, next Friday, noon. I am going over The Fred Factor by Mark Sandborg. Then uh, two weeks after that, I'm revisiting The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. One of the things about these weekly um, uh, book discussions is I am revisiting books that I have already read, and I am encouraging you to do the same. We, I read the Seven. I read this book 15 years ago was the first time I read it. I bring an entirely different perspective to this book than I did 15 years ago. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Most people have read that book, but most people have not read it in the last 10 years. If you, if you read it now, you bring a whole different level of experience. So that's one of the reasons I'm excited about that. And then the week after that, crucial conversation. So noon, Fridays, we'll be talking through some books, um, some of the highlights and some of the ways you might be able to apply. Hope you'll tune into next ones. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.